Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you, choir. I'd invite you to give ear to the reading of God's Word. This morning, we're in Mark chapter 2 and sharing verses 13 to verse 17. Then Jesus went out to the lakeshore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, uh, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many, listen, this is really cool, there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And I'd love it if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind that we would pray together. Oh God, uh, your word says that uh, apart from you, we, we can do nothing. And I sure believe that that's true. And so we ask for your help just now, Lord, that you would open our hearts, that you would soften our disposition so that we could really hear from you, God. And I, I ask, God, that you would speak not just through my words, but God, uh, that you would speak above and beyond. Speak from your word to each of our hearts, God, to each of our minds, and give us, God, the courage to listen and to obey, and therefore to know what it is to have our lives built upon the rock who is Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing our, our series called In Focus, and really this, this whole series is built off of this one verse, Mark chapter 8, verse 33, and, and reading through that, I felt like God just lifted that off the page to me and, and really called us to kind of get after this. And this is where, in Mark chapter 8, this is where Jesus has started telling the disciples about his cross, telling them that he's going to be tortured, that he will be killed, but on the third day he will rise to life. And uh, Peter, and I, I, you know, this is incredible to even think that he would think to do this, but he does. Uh, he says, um, Jesus, I'm going to need to talk to you a minute. And he pulls Jesus aside. The scripture says he, he admonished, he corrected Jesus. He said, Jesus, this cross thing is a bad plan. He said, we actually, I think we need to come up with a new plan. This is essentially what he says to Jesus, and Jesus in turn corrects Peter, and part of how he corrects him is found in, in Mark chapter 8 and verse 33. He says, Jesus says to Peter, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. You see, Peter can't, he can't understand the necessity of the cross, he can't understand <laughs> The, the things that Jesus would do for us on the cross, how he would open life to us. He doesn't see what God is doing because he's not seeing from God's perspective. He has now a worldly perspective. He's seeing with a different set of eyes. And I felt like God brought this before me and said, listen, we need to, we need to get after this question. How are we actually seeing? Are we seeing with the eyes of the world or are we seeing things from God's perspective? Because, because. Listen, one of the greatest dangers, and this is in any age, and this is in any generation, one of the greatest dangers for the followers of Jesus is that as we live in the world, but we are not to be of the world, that our vision, our perception, our worldview would be shaped by the world and not by the revelation of God. That we would actually start to see as the world does, that we would begin to love as the world does, that we would actually begin to worship what the, the, what the world idolizes. And if you look at all of that, you know, what is it that the world really idolizes? What is it that the world really worships? I think that we would have to say, if we could boil it all down, really it comes to this, that the vision of the world is actually about worshiping the self. It is all about the focus on the self. And a big part of that, a big part of that is uh, what we call self-righteousness. And that's really where we're kind of drilling down today is is how do we make a defense? A defense for our hearts, 
a defense for our church against against self-righteousness. And, and so we're going to look first at this question that the, the Pharisees asked, because I think it reveals so much about the self-righteous heart, about the inclination of the human heart toward self-righteousness. They ask this question, it's really startling. They say, why does he eat with such scum? Because here's the thing about self-righteousness. There is this drive in the human heart to be right, not just right on an issue. We all love to be right on an issue, right? But it's bigger than that. This self-righteousness of the human heart is really about being justified, being made right before the universe. It's more about a state of being than about a single issue that we want to be right about. I want to feel as though my existence is justified, that I am righteous. And not only do I want to be right, here's, here's where the human heart goes. And listen, th this is about more. This is about way more than just religious, re religion because the world tells us, oh, the religious, they're all self-righteous and this and that. Secular psychologists are recognizing the drive of the human heart for righteousness. This is not a religious thing. This is a human thing. So not only do we say, I want to be righteous, I want to be more righteous than that guy, right? That's the human heart, the pride of the human heart. I want to make myself right. I don't want to need God to do it. And I want to be, I don't want to just be right. I want to be more right than that guy. And you see, we're seeing this so much in our world today, in our culture. We see it most prevalently now all over politics. And I'm not getting into politics and I'm not trying to be political. I am just saying that you can hear the very same things that the Pharisees were saying said about the other side, whatever the side is, right? This is, this is driving so much in our culture right now, and we are in such danger of this kind of thinking. And so we make a defense of our hearts and a defense of our church against the spirit of self-righteousness. So to start making that defense, I want to get after this one question. And I know this is going to seem really obvious, but please just hang with me a little bit. I hope to make it make some sense, okay? You going to hang with me? Yes, preacher, we're excited to do so. <laughs> Preach on, brother. All right, so question, who is the gospel for? I mean, really, who is the gospel for? It is clear, and this is in, undisputable, right? Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. John the Baptist makes this announcement. There he is. The, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why he came. And so the good news is this. The good news is that God promised that he would do this, that he would send the Savior, he would send the Messiah, he would send this King of Kings who would make us right with God. He would send his very own Son, and now in Jesus, he has done it. He has opened up life for us so that we could live in the abundance of life and the presence of God now, and we could enjoy in the kingdom of heaven eternal pleasures at his right hand. He has done it, and that's the good news. And he did it while we were sinners. And he did it because we were sinners. This is what we read in Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. If we were not sinners, then Jesus would not have had to come. And he would not have had to give his life for us. And, and, listen, it is all a gift this is so essential to the gospel. It is not something that we earn by our own merit. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved. By a gift you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. People who have righteousness in themselves don't need a gift. It's like a paycheck to them. They just have it, right? They think that they have it and they don't need it from God. They don't need it from the Lord. And here's the point that I'm driving at. This is what I was trying to get us to. Now listen, there is never a time for the follower of Jesus, this side of glory, where we are not absolutely dependent upon the gospel of Jesus for our salvation. There is not a moment. We don't mature out of our need for the gospel. We don't get to some spiritual plane where all of a sudden we are no longer dependent upon the grace of Jesus Christ and now we are making our way on our own. Never do we outgrow our need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and listen, this is what happens when self-righteousness begins to mix with the gospel. It is a tragic thing. Because we begin to lose our awe and our wonder of what Jesus has done for us. 
We sing the song Amazing Grace, and it just doesn't seem that amazing to us anymore. And we sing about the amazing love of Jesus Christ, but it just doesn't seem that amazing anymore when we begin to mix self-righteousness with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we make it into a sort of new works righteousness where we are making our way. And here's what I've noticed, and listen, I've recognized this in my own heart. There's been a check in my own spirit about this kind of thing. When we are beginning to build our faith on our own righteousness, what happens when we sin? And we will. The scripture says if we say that we have no sin, that we are not sinners, that we're deceiving ourselves. What happens when we sin? Think about this now. If, if our foundation is on the gospel of Jesus, then we will be grieved, sure. But we will be grieved because we've grieved the heart of our Father. And we will repent and we will trust the scriptures where we read that if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We trust Him. And so we're able to rise up again and we're able to be brushed off and sent again to live for Christ. But if our foundation is on our own righteousness, we will begin to ask this question, how long actually... Will God put up with me? How many more times until I wear out God's patience? How could God accept somebody like me that does something like that? And we forget that the way that God would accept us now, it's the same way that He accepted us when we first came to believe. It is by grace. It is by grace. You know, there's this great preacher uh, of uh, of a, a latter generation, an earlier generation, that is, um, Charles Spurgeon, and I love what he said about the gospel. He said, the gospel is a hospital for the sick. None but the guilty will ever accept its benefits. None but the guilty will ever accept its benefits. And you know, there is such joy. There's such joy for the one who will lay down this desire to prove out our own righteousness. There is such joy and such release and such freedom for the one who is able to say, you know what, I don't have any righteousness. Not in myself. I don't really have anything to offer the Lord that would cause him to pay me for my righteousness. And just to accept the gospel of Jesus as a gift. Just to accept his grace. Just to, just to delight in the goodness of our Savior there is such joy in this. And this, this, listen, it really brings us to our next defense against self-righteousness. And that is the fact that the church, the church is a hospital. It is a hospital and not a museum. It is a hospital and not a museum. And listen, when, when self-righteousness infects a church, it ceases to be about the mission of Jesus. And, and, you know, his name may be on the sign and his name may be in the bulletin and, and that church might sing some things and say some things about Jesus. But the church that has been infected by self-righteousness is no longer about the mission of Jesus Christ. It isn't. You see, in, in the church that's been infected by self-righteousness, it is not about welcoming the sinner. It really is about displaying the righteous. It's like a museum with Actually, I was saying to Becky earlier, it's really more like a zoo, right, with exhibits. Come look at the righteous people. And in that sort of church, guess what? Nobody can mess up. Nobody can dare have any trouble in their life. Because if they do, they're either going to have to pretend that they don't and they didn't, or they're going to have to disappear. Do you know, um, we want to be and I can say this from the heart of the leadership of our church, not, not just about me. We want to be a church where everybody's welcome. We want to be a church where people don't have to be pre-sanctified to come, right? You know what I mean by that? Like, you don't have to have your act together to be here. We, we want to be a church where people who are far from God can be brought near together with us, all depending on the grace of Jesus Christ. We want to be this church where God would take ashes and give us beauty in exchange. We want to be that kind of church. I think it's such a beautiful statement in the Scripture. It's the be most beautiful, I think, part of this passage that we're in today. This, it's the parentheses. Do you notice what was in parentheses? 
there were many of this kind of people. What kind of people? Disreputable sinners. Many of this kind of people among Jesus' followers. Apparently, people who knew they were sinners loved to be around Jesus. Why? Because he loved them. And not only that, because he loved them, he brought healing into their lives. He says healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And this really brings us to our last point, and that is what does the gospel do? What does the gospel do? And the intention seems really pretty clear here, that the intention of our Lord by, by the power of this gospel, this good news, is for the healing of people's lives. That it is not the Lord's intention to just leave us in our sin. Because as the Lord says, sin is bondage. And as is clearly indicated here, sin is the sickness of our souls. And it is not his intention to just leave us in that sickness. He intends for us to be made well. He in intends for us to overcome our sin by the power of of his cross. You know, in the Bible, there are some pretty powerful name changes, right? Some pretty important ones. Um, Abram, right? You remember Abram? He becomes Abraham, and Sarai becomes Sarah, and, and Simon becomes Peter, remember? But I think, actually, there's this subtle indication of a name change here that's so important, that, that is so significant. I want to share this with you. We, we meet up with this guy named Levi, and Levi is a tax collector, and in this day, this is like the worst kind of sinner because they are a traitor to their nation, they are a traitor to their God, they are dishonest, they, they, they live fraud, right? It's just their lifestyle. They are the worst sort of sinners, and I think God is so funny because yesterday I did my taxes. I'm like, God, you, you have such a sense of humor because you knew I was going to be talking about tax collectors today. And, and I will tell you, it was not fun. It was like the negative. It was like the opposite of, of fun. It was negative fun. But as much as we dislike taxes, it, was, it is nothing today as it was then. These are the worst sort of sinners. And, and get this, when everyone is running away from Levi, Jesus is walking toward him. And of all the people he could call, all the people he could call, think about this now, he called the worst sort of sinner to be his disciple. And here's the thing. Levi had to make a decision. He couldn't stay in that life of sin. He couldn't stay there at his tax booth and follow Jesus. This was about turning from sin, repenting, and following Jesus. And he did he chose to follow Jesus. And the scripture doesn't even indicate that he took the time to pick up all the money and all the things at his booth. He stood up and he followed Jesus. He made a decision that he would give his life to the Lord. And, uh, and Jesus gave him a new name. You know, when, um, when Jesus gave Simon a new name, he said, your name's going to be Peter. And, and that means rock. He said, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. But Levi, we actually know him better. Uh, many of you all will know this. We know him better as Matthew. Matthew, the author of the first gospel. And, and Matthew, Matthew, that name, that very name means, that means gift of God. It means gift of God. And so I'm thinking, you know, here's a man who was, who was snatched out of bondage to sin. Here's a man who would never forget what it was like to have everybody else shun him. And yet Jesus walked toward him and chose him. I don't think he ever would have gotten over that love that he knew that day. And I don't think he would ever get over the fact that he was so guilty and he was so laden down with shame. And that day, Jesus lifted it all off of his shoulders. I don't think he ever would have gotten over that. And apparently he had such a heart for the lost, a heart for those who were far from God. He was throwing parties and everything and getting all those dis disreputable sinners together with Jesus that he had such a heart for people to know the love of Jesus Christ that Jesus said, you know what? Your name's not going to be Levi anymore. Your name is going to be gift of God. You are a gift of God to this world. And so here's what I'm thinking this morning as we come to this gospel feast is that what if we just asked, what if we just asked Jesus for the full measure of the benefits of the gospel? 
What if we just asked, Lord, I want to know the full measure of the benefits of the gospel. I want to know what it is to be forgiven and to know that I'm forgiven. To have my sins washed clean, to have the shame lifted off of me, I want to know what that's like. And Lord, I want to know what it's like to be healed of the sin that clings to my life. I want to be healed this morning in Jesus' name. And Lord, this morning, I want to be given such a love for the lost. I want to give, be given such a love for those who are far from God, for those disreputable sinners that you died for, Jesus, that, that I would become, that we would become a gift of God to this world. Because, friends, this world so needs Jesus. So, if you'd be willing, I'd, I'd love it if you would pray together with me in that direction. Could we pray together? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you that, that it's by grace. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. And it is not something that we accomplish. It is a gift from you, God. We thank you because we couldn't earn it. We couldn't deserve it. Try as we might to have righteousness in ourselves, we can't. Thank you for the gospel. And God, we just really want to ask right now, as we prepare our hearts to receive communion, that God, you would pour out on us the full measure of the benefits of the gospel. Lord, convince us. Show us. Make us feel our forgiveness. Lord, liberate us from the hold of sin over our lives and set our feet as messengers of the gospel, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.